Right. Right. Trade contract. secrets and things like that. Well, they do. Um, Which would, in some ways, be similar. Well, maybe. I mean, it's not a great concern. It's it, I, of mine. I think that's a that's a great theoretical. It's more than a theoretical question. It's a, it's an interesting legal question. But I don't I don't see a judge tossing this as being too restrict too restrictive in geographic scope. In addition, in the in those cases, it's the combination of geography plus duration that I think a judge looks at, and if you might have something that is completely and not, is, is not speaking to this bill, um, and in, in another context, you might have a restriction that just on geography alone might seem completely unreasonable and unfair, but if it has a limited time duration, a, a court, I think, would uphold it. Sure. I don't think this is, this even in, uh, but I don't even think this violates it, has a geographical restriction problem. Just curious. Thank you. Further questions? Can I? Representative Thank Mayor. you. Proceed. I, the, the Representative Har raises a really interesting point, actually. So, I guess the way that I'm reading this is if I'm a state representative and I fulfill my term, I have to wait a year before I can be a registered lobbyist. And it's one thing to be a, a legislative lobbyist, uh, and that would obviously be here, but aren't there forms of lobbying that would lobby, for instance, some of our <coughs> counties or some of our cities? And this bill would preclude that as well. Yes, and I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> so, so again, regardless of the, okay, regardless of what your prior relationship may or may not have been before joining the General Assembly, you might not be able to go back even to your old job for a year. Well, we have a member actually that that used to work for one uh, uh, some. Uh, I don't know if it's the city of Kansas City, but within one of, uh, in a, in a, a large city's office, yeah, we have several. And so I guess that would be come back to the same thing, is that I understand you might not go back to the, say I'm um, whatever, I'm, um, okay, say I'm, I'm Mayor Slay's chief of staff. I then become a, a state representative and then I leave and I want to go and lobby on behalf of the mayor or, or lobby on behalf of a private entity within the city of St. Louis. And again, this is purely hypothetical. Your bill would preclude me from doing that for a year. Yes. But it would not preclude me from going back to being the chief of staff, or is that a lobby? You know what I mean? That's certainly an advocacy position. If, if, if you're not. If I'm not set, required to file. Yeah, setting foot, to register. working the halls, working the rotunda. Okay. And then what, what are the penalties? <coughs> We need a penalty section, don't we? And uh, and who violates? Uh, who monitors? Who who watches over this? Well, it would be the ethics commission. Um, I, it would be my idea, and I think by the statute it's there, but we need to clarify that in the bill. Thank you. Oh, actually, can I go back to the prior bill? Is that okay? How long can I think about this? Proceed. Oh, there's and and again I kind of touched on this before. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's bracketed out in what is that 226? Includes a lot of lobbyist reporting, and I don't know if that was 844 that then got overridden. I, you know what I mean? That the court threw out, or if it was what was the bill before 844? Again, I'm a little murky on how this drafting is going. I guess my, my question is: it, it seems to knock out a, a lot of a lot of stuff that looks pretty good to me. So I'm kind of curious and, how that's going to work. And my request to drafting was to add this paragraph, and I was told there's cleanup from the prior bill, which we talked about things that are in statute which aren't really in statute. Okay. Shouldn't because the reviser can't delete things from right. statute. Now, I'm more than willing to go back and, and double check and make sure that everything that's bracketed indeed was part of the bill that was thrown out with Hammerschmidt problems, and we're not throwing something out inadvertently. Um, but my understanding is those brackets relate back to the problem we have, not just with this bill, but a lot of bills that the right. reviser, and we don't want the reviser to just start willy-nilly deleting stuff in the statutes. Right. Um, but then the legislature has to come back after certain Supreme Court cases 
and delete stuff that really are. We could put it back in. Or we could put it back in. If it's a Hammerschmidt problem, we could put it back in. That's right. And that's what I'm. That's what. That's really my concern. Is that are we deleting stuff that was good policy when it was passed in 2010, was thrown out because of the Hammerschmidt issue, and I, I I understand that from a tech. I mean personally, technically, how I would do it is is again bracket it all out and then basically put it all back in because it's already been passed once and apparently if it was good policy in 2010, I think for the most part it's probably good policy now with with some technical tweaks. So that's what I was curious about, and, and we can talk about that later, but I just wanted to touch base about and it. And look, I'm open to that. Part of the, it, I think the reason we filed seven bills here is... <laughs> no Hammerschmidt problem. <laughs> well, that's right. I, and I it, get away from Hammerschmidt, but also bills in this building on big topics have a tendency to get unwieldy and die of their own weight. Yeah. And the idea behind filing a bunch of individual provision bills is that even if the big idea at the end that tries to encompass everything dies of its own weight, hopefully we will have some of these steps actually move forward and become law. No, yeah, I, I, I agree, but I, I, again, my concern is that there might be some good, uh, good bath water that's going out with the baby. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? I would like one. Uh, just a brief one. Not being an attorney, I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate your expertise. Has, is, would this be unique to the state of Missouri, or has this been tried in other states and what were the outcomes? Of 228, that is. 228. I, I believe this is the rule in the United States House of Representatives. I don't know what the rules are in other states, but it makes sense to me. I think it makes sense to the average voter that when somebody runs for office, they run for office for the purpose of serving the people of this state and not as a stepping stone <coughs> to a job as a lobbyist working the hallways or working the rotunda. I also think um, there are instances in which uh, legislators have moved to those jobs who we know, who <coughs> we know there, there's no impropriety there with, with those representatives. There are others, I think, who might have done that, for whom uh, we might think there might have been impropriety at, at some point. And at the very least, in every single one of those examples, to the general public, there is certainly the appearance of impropriety. They don't know, they don't have everyday interactions with some of the folks that might go from this job straight into lobbying. And so they, all they see is, you know, Representative X went to work for a lobbying organization, why? And that doesn't look right. And sometimes it isn't right. And this gets at not just the improprieties that sometimes might happen, but even the appearance of impropriety and its attempt to erase even the appearance. Very good. Representative Just an observation. I actually think in the majority of states, this is the requirement. They're, the vast majority have at least a one-year requirement, some go two, and I think one state even has a five-year cooling off period. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Representative Barnes, for 228, and I'm glad you brought it to the attention of people. I think it does need to be looked at. With that, uh, we'll put that on hold for now. We'll move to House Bill 330. House Bill 330 is a gift ban for items over $30. No member of the General Assembly or such member of staff, employee, spouse, or dependent children shall accept any tangible or intangible item, service, or thing of value over the amount of $30 from any lobbyist as defined in Section 105.470. Um, this is pretty simple. There is, there are, however, there, there are lobbyists in this building who have spouses and daughters and whatever who are legislative assistants. There might need to be some exceptions for consanguinity. Um, and they brought those to my attention. Um, although, and, and affinity, exceptions for some affinity as well. Although, for some cheap husbands, this might be a get out a Christmas free card. <laughs> Good thing. Questions for the bill sponsor? Representative Mitt. Sorry. Well, you've already taken away my, my, my first question, which I was, I think, bound to ask, given that my uh, assistant is in one of those situations. Um, 
my other question though is it limits it just to what thirty dollars a pop thirty dollars a session thirty dollars a month thirty dollars a term is there some sort of time on that you get this relates to individual gifts so, so it is individual gifts there's no uh no. session cap or annual cap but I'd so be, I can I'd still be have open. a thirty dollar a day dinner I'd be open to an annual cap and then um, I have my notes to say page <coughs> seven line 108 this is once one of these longer ones and, and we're probably back to again how to skin the 844 cat um, page yes that's a and I, I think that falls into the same category of let's let's, let's I'm open to going back through and figuring out there's yeah no I, it's a problem no matter how you slice it I and this is my directions were uh, I want a thirty dollar gift ban right and then you delete the out of state travel and I understand that that's covered in in, in the other in which one was that two twenty two twenty six um. So a lobbyist could still spend more than thirty dollars on out-of-state travel, or would the thirty-dollar limit still apply to that? Well, hopefully both will pass, and the thirty-dollar okay. limit would apply to out-of-state travel. But if the thirty-dollar limit passes, well, if the thirty-dollar limit passes, then there's going to be a limit on thirty dollars whether you're in-state or out-of-state. If the out-of-state bill passes, but the thirty dollars doesn't, then obviously there's not a limit on out-of-state. Uh, but reporting but reporting hopefully both pass through both chambers okay thank you thank you mr chair thank you further questions representative Power. to inquire proceed uh do you have an issue or do you think we should put an exemption in there in, for family members who are lobbyists well that's the <laughs> Here, yes, yes, and no. I mean, the, we also need to look at, and I don't know how we how we define this. I mean, there. So, spouse has been lobbyist for thirty five years. Um, other spouse is legislative assistant, has been for a long time as well. Didn't get that job because of because of lobbyist spouse um, that's a situation I think the ordinary average voter looks at and says there's nothing there's no impropriety there on the other hand if you had a situation and I don't know of any off the top of my head uh, where a member gets elected and all of a sudden spouse becomes lobbyist for 12 different organizations that's a, that's a problem um, and maybe we, I, I think the fact that somebody came to me and said, that, hey, we've got a problem, a consanguinity and affinity problem here, and I agree with it, has also raised the issue of extending the lobbying ban beyond elected officials if the spouse or relative was not previously engaged in that occupation and I, I'm not sure I, I'm skilled enough to draft it um, no matter how we draft it there's going to be a way for people to get around it um, thanks if, if there's one thing we know about these laws is that there are lawyers smart no matter how well we craft it there are lawyers out there smart enough to figure out a way around it um, which is there are some proposals in front of the general assembly this year that are the result of the legislature previously passing a bill that there were lawyers crafty enough to work their way around thank you okay. yeah. representative Mitten. So right now, and, and I, I just, I don't know the answer to this. I've been elected, obviously. So my spouse could tomorrow decide to go put out a shingle and say I'm Nelson Minton lobbyist. <coughs> There's nothing that precludes him from doing that at this point, is there? I, I don't think so. I don't think so either, and I had never thought of it. Well, I hadn't thought of it until the consanguinity affinity right. issue, and I don't know of any examples right now of, of that. 
situation. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, yeah. Well, we have members obviously that work in law firms that have also, you know, lobbyist members, but that's again, that's that's different. That's not that's not related. And I guess, okay. I just wanted to ask if, if you were aware of anything that precludes that right now. And what you're suggesting, though, it, it, it sounds to me, although we were concerned about some drafting, is that is that you would be open to having there be such a uh, uh, preclusion. I would be open to it, but it, it has to be drafted right. And, and, and I think... You can take the first crafted. No, I mean, I'm thinking the same crafted. thing, though, but what if my husband was a lobbyist before I decided to run? And I don't know if that's, well, if I, we have members in that boat as I well. I think that might be, a, that probably falls into a different category. You're talking about a person who becomes, I think, the, the appearance of impropriety or the actual impropriety comes into being when you have a spouse who otherwise was not a lobbyist and otherwise never would have set foot in this building and then their spouse gets elected and all of a sudden they've got 10 clients. Right. Okay, thank you. Very good. Other questions? To, to continue along that line of thinking though, even if their spouse previously was, or any family member previously was a lobbyist, there's nothing to preclude them from suddenly going from one client to a dozen clients. That's true. That's, so, I mean, the same concerns could apply whether or not they were previously identified as a lobbyist. That's true as well. I love this thinking out loud. So, yeah. uh, the frustration of unintended consequences, but it is it's good that you brought it up. Other questions? Representative Mitten, I believe, is going to take the first crack at drafting. <laughs> Did I just get voluntold? <laughs> It is frustrating, though, that as much as we try to discourage bad behavior, sometimes it's almost as if we give incentive to a certain few to take advantage of it, so that, that is discouraging. But thank you for that. Uh, if no further questions, we will move to House Bill 331. Representative Barnes. House Bill 331 prohibits members of this body from being paid political consultants of other members. Um, there is a drafting issue with this one. 105, proposed 105.453 says no member of the General Assembly shall accept or receive compensation of any kind as a paid political consultant for any candidate seeking the office of state representative or state senator or any current member of the General Assembly. I think we need to ensure that this talks about um, payments from candidate committees as well as the actual state representatives or state senators. Um, it, it's not a huge drafting issue, it's just a little cleanup to make sure we get at the actual intent. Good. Questions? Okay, I have a couple if I can. My first question is, and, and I know you're probably not going to like this question, is why are we limiting this to elected members not being able to also be paid Political or paid consultants, and and this comes about with the you know with staffers. So we have staffers that are here, and um, during you know during the year being paid by the state of Missouri, and during the summer I don't know if they're taking leave of absence or whatever, but they're also being paid. They're being paid both by the state of Missouri and we're being paid by campaign um, committees, and that to me is is. An, an equally disturbing issue as far as I'm concerned that we have um, sort of people feeding at both both ends of that trough. Well, that's not, that not a concern of yours? Staff are not deciders in this building and this gets at limiting deciders. So what's the problem then, I guess, with deciders also working on other people's campaigns? Well, if you have a, a member who is a campaign consultant that has the power to kill or move along legislation that is sponsored by one of their clients, there's certainly the appearance of impropriety when that member with deciding power over that legislation gets to decide whether it moves on or not, when there might be a political advantage to
to letting it pass for their client. And that political advantage, because they would be a campaign consultant, also translates into a personal monetary advantage. And then um, I, I'm going to have to come back to some of the spousal issues as well. So we do, you know, I'm like, granted my husband's only on a on a school board, but if basically this would preclude me from assisting him for compensation. And and for some reason, I actually thought that this was already prohibited. That if my husband ran for school board, and again, it must have been a really big expensive race that he's going to pay me for my help, but that I would be precluded from um, being compensated as a result of his at, of his working on his campaign. Well, I think a member who chose to get paid by a spouse for a local political campaign is walking a very fine line um, between legal and illegal activity. Okay, so I, yeah, I'm not, I mean, obviously I've never done it, but I, I, yeah. I, I've always had a sense that there was already something, well, maybe it's just being untoward as opposed well, you, to actually illegal. You can't, you can't use, no candidate in the state can use cam, campaign funds to for, pay spouse. for personal use. And then the question would be whether that payment to the spouse was for actual services rendered or did it is somehow a conversion to personal use. And thank you for clarifying. That's probably why it was that I thought that some of this stuff was already not uh, not kosher. Thank you. Other questions? Seeing none. Thank you, Representative Barnes. And I will turn the chair back over to you. clarify the MO here. It is, if you're coming up to testify, be prepared to testify on all of the bills for which you wish to testify at one time, and we'll, we'll go in order of the bills for which you wish to testify. Um, because of, we have it was seven different ways, I'm not going to call people up by those who are in favor of those support because you might support some and oppose some. So can I get a show of hands of how many people are planning to testify? Seeing three. Uh, you guys can fight who wants to. Gentlemen, you're closest. Yes, sir. And I'm the most boring. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee, and the, the chairman and I have discussed this issue. Uh, I probably introduced myself. Sam Licklider testifying for Sam Licklider. Also, I suspect <laughs> Kathy. Um, we are one of the, uh, we are the couple that was referenced earlier. Um, I have been a lobbyist uh, for a long time. And she has been uh, in her job in various capacities for a long time. We have not been married that long, so it wasn't a situation where we jumped in, whatever. Um, this also affects, you've got situations in the General Assembly where you have a parent and a child who one is a representative, one is registered as a lobbyist. You have uh, children of lobbyists who work in various capacities within the General Assembly. Uh, you may even have first cousins. Uh, at one point, I think you had a pair of brothers. Um, all of those things get to be somewhat awkward. Uh, and I think you have a public policy question of uh, how deeply do you delve into people's personal, intimate lives. I think a reasonable thing is to exempt um, and go out, and I will have to admit, I did not do real good on the degrees, so third or fourth degree consanguinity or affinity. Consanguinity means by blood, affinity means by marriage. That at least I do remember. Um, 
As as to the the question of uh, well, that, that, I'm going to limit myself to that, and I am testifying for informational purposes only. Secretly, would you prefer us to pass it as is? <laughs> Pardon me. Well, your wife happens to be in the hearing room, so I said secretly, would you prefer us to pass the bill as is? No, I would not. Because <laughs> that's a that's a very good question. That's a very good answer. No, no, no. I mean, it it, it creates a silly situation. I, I remember back a number of years ago when there was a limitation on a uh, you had to report as a lobbyist you had to report dinners of over twenty five dollars. Curiously enough, there wasn't a dinner in town. Now this been a long time ago. That was more than twenty four dollars and thirty seven cents. It's silly. Make the laws, make them simple and, and easy to to abide by. Don't don't get creative. <laughs> Further questions for this witness? I'll come to think of it since it works both well. I never mind. <laughs> Seeing none, thank you for your testimony thank you. here today. And here's my paperwork. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Mike Reed representing the Missouri Society of Governmental Consultants here for informational purposes only, just to bring to your attention what uh, Sam has said uh, about uh, families and, and reporting on families. Also the question, why just don't care? It's not for us to make the policy decisions, it's for you to make the policy decisions on where they should be and how much they should be. We just want to report. But the real question is, is that $30 per day? Is that $30 per year? Is that $30 per client? Is that $30 per lobbyist? Is that $30 per principal? Uh, we just want to make sure that that's clear. Also, on the, on the reporting side, uh, I bring to your attention uh, the, the, the statement on, on page what is it, eight of the bill, uh, section 13. No Identify the bill. Identify. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, 330. House Bill 330. No lobbyist shall make any contribution to or expenditure for any candidate committee formed by a candidate for state representative, state senator, general assembly member, or food, entertainment, lodging, etc. Uh, which appears to say that lobbyists cannot provide an in-kind contribution to uh, a, a committee. But it doesn't preclude the principal from doing that, nor does it preclude the lobbyist's continuing committee from doing that. I just bring that to your attention. We're more than happy to do what we can. We're more than happy to work with you in any way, shape, or form. Also, I also bring to your attention, uh, if you're going to, to work on this, uh, Section 105470, the definition of expenditure, has in it uh, a provision that says an expenditure uh, is not an expenditure if it's uh, uh, within a certain degree of consanguinity. The word affinity was not put in that part of the statute at the time. It was a mistake that was done. It was put in originally, the rap section was originally put in when a um, senator, representative and senator, turned out and became a lobbyist and his spouse became a representative. So, uh, but we're more than happy to work with you in any way we can to clean it up. From the lobbyist side, we just want to make sure that the reporting is clear, accurate, and um, we follow the rules. Thank you, gentlemen. Questions of this witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony today. And I, I'm going to get in trouble with the clerk's office if I don't mention this. You have to fill out a witness form, gentlemen. Everyone has to fill out a witness form. I don't want to be lashed upstairs. So. We have to fill out one for each. Bill? You can fill out. I think we can we can get by with one, and you can list all the bills you're testifying upon in that one. Although I'm risking a I'm risking a lashing from the clerk's office on that as well. But go ahead. My name is Susan Cook, and I'm here on behalf of Empower Missouri. And I have written testimony from our executive director, Jeanette Mott-Oxford, who is actually parking her car and running into the building trying to get here in time. Um, 
but I have written testimony to present on her behalf that we support each of the bills, uh, except for 228, we're just testifying and for informational purposes only. And if I would have talked slower, maybe she would have made that question on her way. Let's take a short break uh, for Ms. Ms. Oxford to, to make her way um, because I spoke with her on Thursday. We are going much faster than I thought we would.